You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number six. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today's episode is supported by The Wool Room. The Wool Room is dedicated to delivering you a better night's sleep. At thewoolroom.com you can choose from a wide range of mattresses, mattress protectors, bedding and beds filled with British wool, ensuring that you stay cool and comfortable at night. Find out how wool can improve your sleep by visiting thewoolroom.com and claim your 10% discount with the promo code WOOLACADEMY. That is the promo code WOOLACADEMY written all in one word. Today on the show we have Andy Coy. He is the founder and managing director of Armadillo Marino. Armadillo Marino was launched in 2011 as a new brand of merino wool clothing with the goal to reduce injuries and save the lives of frontline officers. Welcome Andy, so good to have you on the show today. Good morning Elizabeth, hi there. <laughs> hi, <laughs> well I think we should just get right into it by you telling us a little bit about your background and how you started working in the wool industry. Okay, I'm a New Zealander by birth, and I was fortunate enough to be raised on a, a sheep station down in Otago, where we were farming crossbred sheep, so at the, the height of the season, we'd have about 20,000 sheep on the property, and uh, that was my first introduction to wool, so as a young young boy going into the hills, always having wool garments to hand in case the weather changed, which it often did in the south of the South Island, and From there, I moved through to study agriculture at Lincoln University, just outside Christchurch, where I studied international marketing and got my first taste of exporting products out of New Zealand, of which wool being a, an important primary product was, uh, was, was one of the key motivations for, for looking at wool. So when I, when I graduated, my first job was working at, at Wool Research Organization of New Zealand, uh, working on Neeps, neeps and knops um, before getting involved in the kiwi fruit industry and so I was involved with exports um, for a number of years until the late 80s when I decided to do my overseas experience and my driver was to head to Scotland to see if I could work in some of the knitwear mills that were producing Lyle and Scott and Pringle and some of the other famous names that we don't see anymore. In, in the borders, but it was a, a difficult time in the late 80s. It was uh, depth of recession, so I ended up not getting a job. But stayed in Scotland until the formation of the New Zealand Merino Company, or it was Merino New Zealand Incorporated, the marketing organization, when that was first formed in 1996. So I joined them in Uh, that year to represent them for the European market and in North America. Okay, and then what made you start Armadillo Marino? And tell us a little bit about the business. Uh, well, I suppose my time working for Merino New Zealand and then New Zealand Merino Company, we had exposure to a lot of different brands working in different market sectors and particularly looking at the emergence of the outdoor I used the merino wool in the outdoor sector with brands like Icebreaker and Smart One Ibex appearing and experiencing rapid growth. And um, after I left New Zealand Merino, I went and joined Ibex Outdoor Clothing in Vermont in the United States. And we were supplying out the back door to U.S. soldiers who wanted an alternative to synthetic base layers. So they were buying the uh, merino base layers to wear in Iraq and then more recently in Afghanistan. Um, and that was really the catalyst for looking at the formation of Armadillo Merino because here we had um, U.S. soldiers who their, their official uniform was, was a synthetic product, but they were buying by choice merino wool garments because of the the uh, performance benefits that they could attain from it. So we felt that it was crazy seeing these soldiers wearing synthetic base layers in Iraq and then more recently in, in Afghanistan wearing the synthetic because 
as the synthetic was melting and dripping and, and catching fire, causing horrific accidents uh, and life-changing injuries to any soldiers that were exposed to heat and flames. And recognizing the inherent properties of, of a wool and its ability to um, not melt, not drip, and be flame resistant up to about 600 degrees centigrade. It made a lot of sense that we should be outfitting professional people with Merino as a base layer, particularly those professionals working in high risk environments. And so that was really the catalyst for establishing the, the company in 2011 was our, our ability to um, save lives and, and protect those who are first responders or working in high-risk environments anywhere around the world. Wow, that's a really powerful story. But I just have one more question. Um, how did you then start the business in the UK? I was working in the United Kingdom and felt that the, the environment in the UK would have been conducive to establishing Armadillo Marino because of the global reputation of the British soldiers, uh, the British police and, and their fire service. Uh, so that was the motivation to be based out of the UK and to tap into the, the, the good heritage that they have here in this country. And tell me, is there, um, did you see that before, that there was a change in how military and so on bought these th synthetic clothing? Was there a decision because of price or how did so much synthetics end up on our soldiers? Yes, it, it does seem rather crazy, doesn't it? That you're, you're putting a dangerous product onto people who are going into a dangerous environment. So you're, you're actually creating uh, more danger for them when they should be looking at better protection. The, the key driver for the adoption of these synthetic garments was the influence of the out uh, the, the sporting industry and the use by athletes of wearing these synthetic products with the perception that this is going to be better for performance uh, but the reality is that it actually hinders performance and it has the potential to inflict real real problems onto any of these officers so we were battling against the perception that synthetic products were superior to uh, the natural properties of wool And also from a price point of view, these synthetics were regarded as um, very cheap to the point that they could be disposable at the end of a, a six-month tour. So uh, a group of soldiers being deployed to Afghanistan would be issued with six base layer garments each. They'd have to change them every day because of the odor. And then at the end of the six-month tour, they would dispose of them. They'd burn them in fire pits because they couldn't recycle them because of the odor issue. So it's it's very wasteful. Um, it's not very resourceful. Um, you've got the dangers of the product being, the dangers of the product for the soldier wearing it. And we felt that we could offer a, a, a healthier solution and one which was better for the soldier and for the environment. Yeah, I, I I really think that's a wonderful story to tell also when you you talk to the people making those decisions. And um and can you describe your target group? We define our target audience as professional users working in extreme environments um on a daily basis. So these are we're not necessarily catering for recreational users because they can choose to be fair weather walkers or skiers, but we're working with people who have an element of risk in their job, um, but it's their obligation to, to go and perform that task day in, day out. So we want to change their mentality so that they're wearing armadillo base layers 365 days in the year, and when they're on the job, wearing it 24-7. And when you look at your target group, What was their understanding and knowledge about wool? And did you have to do any educating about the benefits of wool? Um, it's, there's a number of challenges to the market that we're dealing with because it's very fragmented. You've got user groups, you've got procurement, you've got management, and then you've got directors. And each of those groups have to be uh, touched 
touched upon to help them understand the benefits of the product. So from a from an education point of view, uh, what we did initially was look for industry leaders, so people who wanted to recognise that there recognise that there were dangers there with the existing clothing system, and were willing to make an investment in a garment system that was more expensive, but for the better health and well-being and safety of their their officers. Um, but there's been a, a huge requirement for education. Uh, we've lost a generation of users who have had no exposure or no experience of wool, and they have negative perceptions. So we were we were having to take people from a, a a negative rather than a neutral point of view and move them across to understanding that actually this is a very technical, um, high performance fiber. Yeah, and what I really like about your brand, Armadillo Marino, is that you actually have defined this target group very, very clearly. Because when I look at other brands, be it in the industry or outside, I, I feel that um, brands sometimes tend to struggle with defining a clear uh, target audience. And that can either be that they don't want to exclude anyone or they don't want to miss out on any potential sales or any markets. And sometimes they might even not be sure who is the right target market. But um, looking at your brand, I can see that it has so many advantages of really defining your target group very tightly. And also, I, I assume it makes each you know day when you have to make decisions for the business much easier if you know who to focus on. And um, And then I, but then when I went also close to have a closer look at at your target audiences, it, it is a niche. But then even within that niche, your market still seemed quite large because you you have firemen, military, motorsports, spaceships, and beyond. And maybe you can take us a little bit through that process when you define your target audience and how is it helping you in your everyday business, and maybe give some advice to other companies who are struggling with that. I think increasingly so. There's there's such a plethora of brands emerging into the market, and the barriers to new brands being launched are becoming less and less. But it becomes all the more important to clearly define what your brand represents and and who it's targeted for. So we felt that we would we would look at this market market because firstly there wasn't. Uh, wasn't really any competing products there and we could make a significant difference. So there was a fundamental belief that we could, you know, we, we, we care and we wanted to share our knowledge of, of wool and, and help these people. Um, but increasingly looking at some of the complexities of the traditional fashion industry, what our target market offered us was the ability to supply a, the same consistent quality and uh, styling of garment year in, year out. So once you had, once your product's adopted by a user group, then it moves into repeat purchases. So you're not having to deal with seasonality, spring, summer collection, autumn, winter collection. This is a year in, year out product. And what we're trying to do is encourage them to wear it throughout the year. You're quite right. The, uh, the niche is, uh, is quite a large niche. And um, although they, Uh, it, it is a very large niche and these people wearing these products every day. So you do have a, a, a high level of consumption just because of the, the, the sheer number of people involved and the, the hours that they're wearing your product. And I saw on your website that uh, Armadillo Merino t-shirts even made it to space because I think people like us astronauts in the International Space Station are wearing your T-shirts. How did Amadello go to space? Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it's, a, it's a great story. And I think it's a, a, an amazing endorsement of, of wool as a fiber. Um, I visited NASA in May 2014. Um, and that was just at the time that they'd been evaluating our product and they'd, they'd put some of the astronauts up to the space station wearing it. And what was very exciting was that in meeting with the scientists that were involved in the clothing development team, they have been trying to solve apparel problems for astronauts since the first man went into space. 
And when, when they first put man into space, they outfitted them in synthetic man-made uniforms uh, using man-made fabrics because they felt that was the, the way that was the way of the future. Um, but since ever since they first put man up in space, they've been trying to treat fabrics to remove static, remove odor, to provide stretch, to provide longevity, and to not have flammability. And here we are. Uh, in 2016, offering them a, a product with all the attributes that they've been trying to seek through man-made fibers. Um, so the, the development program with NASA has been fascinating and what, what it's enabled us to continue to push the boundaries as to what Merino can achieve as a, as a technical performance fiber. Yes, I think that that's such a wonderful story and um, I think that's probably also a story that helps you um, with your social media content and another thing that I saw when looking at your different social media outlets is that you have actually a lot of images of people wearing your products in real life. Can you tell us a little bit about that, like how are these Uh, people sending you their images because they're so happy with their product and how yeah how do you get to this these kind of stories well, f well i think firstly the the user groups that we're working with are amazing athletes and we we're constantly being compared our professional market being compared against the sports market but we these are people who are collectively training and getting fit to perform to the best of their ability and Unlike sportsmen who go on to a playing field, these people go out not knowing how long they're going to be out there and performing for. So what we wanted to do was reflect that these people are real athletes, real people with friends and comrades and family that they work with and bring the, the true, the grittiness of, of what they're doing um, as a way of reflecting the the. the the functionality of, of the product. So these people are, are not, the people that feature on our social media, they're not paid athletes. They are people that are wearing and uh, testing and, and trying our, evaluating our product out in all sorts of different conditions. And what they're doing is they're sharing those experiences with us um, because it's provided them with significant benefits and allowed them to perform those tasks more readily. So we, we, we've got some great people, some great personalities, and the stories that we get at trade shows, if only we could capture some of those on, on video because the, these people are, are doing remarkable feats and it's, it's, it's so often in the line of duty, whether it's, it's attending to road traffic accidents or uh, mountain rescue teams um, or soldiers in, in combat situations. It's... Uh, Every, every one of them's got a, a remarkable story to tell. Yeah, and I think those are the, the, the stories that work so well on social media. And can you tell us a little bit about your social media strategy? How are you using the different media social media platforms on your business? We are undertaking a, a bit of a shotgun approach to our social media because it's... Um, It, it's it's difficult because a lot of our user groups have their own forums and so it's trying to work with them and engage them at a level that's appropriate to to their community so rather than preaching to them about the benefits of, of armadillo it's looking at getting the stories that we're telling to appeal to those different user groups um, but it's such a Social media is such a, a challenge because it's constant and it's forever changing and the level of adoption by these different groups changes um, from sector to sector and, and country to country. Um, so to be truthful, we don't have a, a clear strategy because it's it's constantly constantly changing, um, but it's one that we're, we're learning and getting more effective at the more we participate, the more feedback we're getting from our users. And can you give an estimate how much time you invest into social media? <laughs> uh, officially, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I, I think it's, we have daily activities. We schedule posts um, up to two weeks out. 
and then there's day-to-day -day engagement. So it depends on what what level of what stories are going out or what's relevant and topical at that particular time. Mm. But I'm guessing it does take up quite a bit of time every day. So um, it it is I think always a struggle for a lot of businesses who who know that they can probably get a lot of out of social media, but it's also a big investment of time and and creative ideas. Yes, and you you never know where where that investment's going to pay off. So you participate, you're going to be in to play, uh, but you never know where that re the, the reward's going to come from. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And I would like to go back a little bit uh, to the business itself. Um, can you maybe take us back in time? What were the biggest challenges when you started Amadillo Marino in 2011? And where do you see your biggest challenge today? Uh, going back to the beginning, I suppose we entered into the market sector not knowing how these institutional organizations operate. We had our, our love and enthusiasm for, for wool, but we, we didn't really understand the market that we were going into. And having come, in, come from working with retail brands, consumer brands, and work at retail, um, this, this offered a whole new set of challenges. And I think particularly looking at the institutional uh, structure of police, fire, and military, a lot of it is building your network and it's trying to find the right people who can make the right decision and help you understand how the procurement process works and finding those people who are recognized and respected as industry leaders. And that was the hardest thing because you do, you just don't know where to start and you think you've got a great product, but uh, there's, there's, people don't see a need for it. And until you can demonstrate that actually their existing product is inadequate, you're, uh, you're pushing, pushing it. The other aspect is because the procurement process is long and slow, there is no obligation for them to procure product. And so a lot of the business that we're now generating has taken 18 months to two years to generate. So it's building, building contacts, building those relationships, educating them, and then going through the trial and evaluations before finally landing an order. So it, it, it does take a long time. And I think it's that, that lack of speed or urgency to make a decision that's been the biggest challenge for us. So things have taken a lot longer to build brand awareness and to get the product adopted. Um, so that's been our biggest challenge. Oh, and is, do you see that still as your biggest challenge today or what are you struggling with today? Uh, I think it's it will continue to be, but it's it's like a we look at it like a snowball. Every year our customer base gets bigger and bigger, and the more more people buy it, the more people talk to their friends, and that's one of the beauties of of the sectors that we're working in is there's there's great peer to peer endorsement, and our our garments are the armadillo garments are regarded as Gucci gear, so it's the product that people chase and pursue because it it gives them a, an edge and uh, um, people like to buy the, the better products um, particularly when the issued product isn't isn't up to standard so we have a growing a growing consumer base and growing awareness uh, at each of the different levels within the market sectors and you have a long breath because as you said um, it often takes quite a while for some of the decision makers to to decide for your product. <laughs> well, if someone had said it will take you five years to get real momentum going, I, at the beginning I wouldn't have believed them, but now in reflection um, I can understand why and often reflect back and go, well, you know, what are the shortcuts? And there probably aren't any shortcuts. You've 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 got to invest. You've got to invest time into networking and meeting the meeting the people that can help you in, in the journey. Mm. And can you maybe also share with us your biggest learning that other people can learn from? Uh, I think particularly with wool, wool's a, a, a premium product, so you've got to invest in, in your product and believe in it. 
um, and, and so don't compromise. I think one of the one of the challenges that we're always having to deal with is is the price points of of synthetics. But the way we present it to people, it's a bit like looking at a, a at, at a traditional Nokia phone versus a smartphone. Now we 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 position our product as multi attribute that it caters for a, a a wide range of user requirements as opposed to single attributes, which is what the synthetics offer, and that people have to recognize the value of having those collective properties rather than focusing on one single attribute. And um, and so by, leaving, by believing in the product and the, the benefits that it can deliver to the user, once you've got someone on board, they're, they're usually a customer for life. Oh, I really like that. I've never heard someone explain it like that, but I think... Um this single attribute and multi attribute that's a really nice way of of selling wool um thank you for sharing that and you've worked all your life in the wool industry and you know the supply chain very well and is there something you would say that could ideally change in the wool industry to make it easier for companies like amadillo or to make companies like your own more successful Yeah, I think it's it's always been a challenge for the wool industry, and one thing is is building awareness of wool. But actually, consumers don't buy wool; they buy brands. And we need to, as an industry, look at supporting brands and new and emerging brands who are creating new niches, because that's ultimately where the the consumer transaction takes place. Consumers buy brands, and the brands are the communicators of of what the properties and benefits of are of wearing wool. And so if you can get consumers engaged and in love with a brand, then you'll get repeat purchase and you'll get good brand ambassadors. Okay, I think that's a very good pa uh, place to stop our conversation. Uh, thank you so much for sharing everything uh, you did today. And before we wrap up, how can people find out more about Armadillo Merino and how can they connect with you? Uh, Armadillo Merino garments are available through our website at armadillomerino.com um, and we have, uh, we're always looking for any participants who want to contribute stories of their adventures or misadventures, especially when they're wearing our product. So if you want to have a look at the, the website and then join in on our social media and we'd welcome any any contribution or if anyone wants to contact me directly it's andy at amadillomerino.com great and we'll also make sure to link to all those different websites and social media accounts in our show notes to make it easier for people to find you and yeah thank you so much for today and i wish wish you continued success with amadillo merino Thanks, Elizabeth. Good Thank talking. You. Thank you so Cheers. much. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you learned as much as I did from the interview with Andy Coy from Armadillo Merino. If you want to find out more about Andy and his business, look at the show notes by visiting elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 006. Once again, elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 006. If you liked today's episode, may I suggest that you subscribe to our podcast so that you don't miss any of our weekly episodes. Also, let us know what you think of the show by leaving a comment in the comment section underneath each podcast episode on the website. Maybe you have a particular question that you would like us to ask or a suggestion for a guest for one of our upcoming episodes. Whatever it is, we would love to hear from you. Thank you and see you next time.